right, everyone, we've just moved down the road maybe three quarters of a mile. Uh, we are still out here at Jackson's flank attack, but we are actually at the fallback position we call the Bushbeck line. And it's important to stop where we are. Because number one, this is land that was recently preserved by our members of the American Battlefield Trust, as well as our partner and their members, the Central Virginia Battlefields Trust. And we are out here along what's called the Bushbeck line, along the very loud road, to show you one of the few monuments at Chancellorsville this was placed here by Mark Dunkelman and the descendants of the 154th New York, known as the Hardtack Regiment, who have entered their first campaign of the American Civil War. Most people know the 154th New York from Gettysburg, because that is where Amos Humiston, Sergeant Amos Humiston, was mortally wounded and found dead up near uh, York Street uh, uh, on the first day of the battle. He dies there holding a picture of three children, and that becomes a national sensation of trying to figure out who was this unknown soldier, and it turns out that it was this New Yorker who had three children as well as his wife, who will all actually move to Gettysburg um, after the war and move into an orphanage for uh, war children. But the Bushbeck line ran north to south right along here. This is the orange turnpike that runs back to Chancellorsville just down the road. So when the Federals start to fall back, we start having those problems where Carl Schurz starts to give way, others start to give way, and they need to find a place to fall back to. Well, Adolphus Bushbeck, a colonel down in this area, decided that he wanted to put up a fallback position, a low line of entrenchments or fortifications to hold back the Confederates a fallback position. This position will hold anywhere between 15, maybe 30 minutes um, depending on who you read and who you believe. Uh, but this will slow down Stonewall Jackson. So don't believe everything you read about the 11th Corps just fleeing. There are pockets of soldiers who stand and fight. And the most famous and probably the most organized will be about 5,000 rifles that are put together in this Bushbeck line. Not always entire regiments. It might be knots of men. It might be an entire regiment. But they will try to hold back this uh, tide of Stonewall Jackson as long as they can. But coming up onto the field will be their commanding officer, the 11th Corps, Oliver Otis Howard, who was nowhere to be found at first because he was down at the Catherine Iron Furnace, but he rides right into this melee. When Howard arrives, he likens this to a storm that broke that he and his brother saw when they lived as boys in the eastern end of Maine, and this tornado erupts. And that's what he sees when he arrives here. And as he tries to rally his men, he grabs the flagstaff from a set of colors, tucks it under the stump of his amputated arm, holding the reins of his horse in his other hand, trying to rally his men. He's personally brave, and he's trying to lead by example. But in fact, he later admits that he'd sought death on this battlefield. He's so mortified by what's going on that he wished he could die. Yeah, and I talk a lot about uh, Oliver Otis Howard not being the, the brightest in the Army or the best commander or whatever. He is brave to a fault. He is a Medal of Honor recipient. Uh, he, he lost an arm during this war. There is no question about his bravery. He is not the man to be leading a corps, or if you ask me later in the war, an army. But that's another uh, story for another time. But he's out here leading by example. And again, I think one of the reasons he's out here is to try to buy the farm so at least he falls in action so that it might be, uh, you know, kind of, you know, a way of saying, well, I screwed up, but look, I gave my life for my country and that makes up for it a little bit. But Howard survives the war. And Chris talked earlier about how he ignored messages from skirmishers who were out hearing Jackson's move. He's got, you know, on the ground reconnaissance that he's ignoring. He leads Barlow's reserve division down to Catherine Furnace. So he must think that that center of gravity around Catherine Furnace is the fight. And so that, you know, your corps commander, you lead your men into the fight. Uh, and maybe perhaps he's sort of ignoring the inactivity out here because he wants to be where the action is, not knowing that the action is coming to him. When he comes back, this was his headquarters, so this was sort of the nerve center of all that hustle and bustle. This is the site of Dowdle's Tavern. It actually operated as, as Gatewood Tavern until 1857 when Peter Dowdle bought it. He operated as a tavern until 1863 when he sold it to the Chancellor's family. Melcy Chancellor, Chancellor, whom Chris mentioned earlier, uh, is a, a pastor who services a lot of small churches here, including the Wilderness Church across the street. He and his family will live in this building for a while. Howard's going to use it as his headquarters. And then as the attack sweeps through here, a lot of the Federals will try to hide under the building to avoid getting captured by the Confederates who find them. They drag them out by their legs and they're going to impress those new prisoners to serve as orderlies in a field hospital that will get set up in this building um, 
The property itself has, uh, the integrity of the property has been compromised when they expanded Route 3, which you can see off to my left there and behind me. Um, so this is what we have left of the site. The tavern will survive the war, but it'll burn down in 1869. This is also the site where the last known order of Stonewall Jackson uh, comes on the battlefield. He's in this area using the kind of the rise that it offers to see what's going on. A.P. Hill, whose exhausted reserves are coming up and having to deploy to go into the battle next. He rides up here to talk to his commander to get the lay of the land. And Jackson pulls a switcheroo. He says, Put, uh, drive them hill, cut them off from the ford which means instead of going straight east toward the Chancellorsville intersection, which has been the objective, he wants to go to the northeast to try to get behind the Federal Army, cut them off from the Ford so that they can't escape. This is a huge switcheroo. And Chris, let me ask you, is this a good idea for Stonewall Jackson to suddenly change the plan? No, it's a terrible idea, to be quite frank with you, because if you're Joe Hooker, you're like, yeah, let's have this happen, because Hooker's been reacting, but one of the things he hasn't done is moved the 1st and 5th Corps in a little while. The 1st Corps under John Fulton Reynolds and the 5th Corps under George Gordon Meade, who I think pound for pound is the best combat officer in the um, uh, Union Army at that level at this point. He is, uh, they're sitting up there with basically two fresh corps, who are in a very strong position uh, along Hunting Run, and they're also going to have artillery to back them up. So they're going to march into the woods, into the dark of your Confederates, into the teeth of the two, two of the best corps in the Army. Plus, once you do that, you've now exposed your right flank to the rest of Hooker's Army. The third corps will be called back up from the Catherine Iron Furnace to fill the gap in the center of the line. You have Joe Hooker turning artillery to fire off in this direction. He has a band out playing military airs. Uh, he is riding around on his horse Colonel trying to get people's spirits back up after they saw the 11th Corps start to retreat past them. You would hear this gasp, oh my God, here they come. And they saw the 11th Corps running towards the Chancellorsville Crossroads about a mile and a half to two miles behind the camera. So Hooker's reacting and some of these reactions, which will play out not so positively for him later on, um, would actually play right into a death trap for the Confederates, where they would go in one direction, and then in another direction, you would have the 3rd and 12th Corps coming in. So you're hitting three large corps and then a smaller corps with the 12th. Yeah, let's do the instant replay on me asking that question. <laughs> oh. oh, I pulled my back out. <laughs> we get that question a lot. What if Stonewall Jackson hadn't been shot at Chancellorsville? I'm a big Jackson fanboy, and I still don't like those numbers. You know, that would be a terrible idea. So getting shot, as we'll talk about in an upcoming video, might be one of the best things to happen to Lee in this battle. Because if Jackson carries on and heads into the teeth of the 1st and 5th Corps, that is a terrible spot to end up. So uh, I'm going to ask my friend uh, Chris to come back on here for a second. We're going to bring on a special guest to talk a little bit about the uh, preservation of this area. Yeah, so uh, before we do that, I just want to point out what's happening right now. First off, I mentioned that uh, hookers react. So there are a lot of moving parts. Let's try to bring this all together. The 11th Corps is facing this way. Now we started to face this way. Tried to do that here at the Bushbeck line. Jackson is pushing forward. He's losing unit cohesion. Why? Because some of the men are moving down the road. That's open, so they move much more quickly. Others are in the woods, and they have to move through woods. Then you will deal with pockets of Confederate or Union resistance. To actually capture uh, Union soldiers, sometimes you'd have to run from the ranks and grab them and tackle them. Other men had been marching for 50 minutes every hour, stopping for 10. They hadn't eaten all day. They come into the camps, the 11th Corps, they're flush with food. In fact, Oliver Otis Howard, one of the other boneheaded moves, things that he does during this campaign, he brings 125 supply wagons with him against orders. And they are all crowded down in this area, adding to the confusion of the battle. There's teamsters, there's wagons, there's mules, there's horses adding to this confusion. But for the Confederates, at supper. So they run in there, try to capture that. The first two waves are going to start getting intermingled for Jackson, Colston, and Rhodes, and that is going to uh, necessitate a halt just down the road from us. Hooker on his side of things. Fighting Joe Hooker doesn't have the best battle at Chancellorsville, but it's not as bad at points as some people make it out to be. They just write off Joe as a drunk. Um, Joe is reacting. 
as I mentioned, he's turning artillery to this place. He's bringing the third corps back up to fill a gap. He's also uh, got bands out playing patriotic airs. He has got officers out trying to stop the 11th corps route. In fact, the 11th corps to add to their woes, some of the officers in the rear will pull out pistols and fire at them whenever they won't stop running past them. Winfield Scott Hancock atop his charger will start swinging his sword at men to try to get them back into line, insulting them to get them back in their fighting spirit. Some, can, some Federals run from this side of the Confederates to Robert E. Lee's side of the Confederate Army and get captured there. Remember, we have Jackson on this side, the Federals in the middle, Lee on the other side, Jubal Early here, and then more Federals. It's like dominoes of different armies here at Chancellorsville. And now, in the middle of uh, Lee's wing of 14,000 men, Jackson's wing of about 31,000 men, you have a really angry 72,000 or so Federals who are now being pressed from two sides and contracting, contracting, contracting into a position what we will call a salient. And we'll explore that a little bit more tomorrow. So there's a lot of things happening out here. And those, those things that are coming together are going to create opportunities for Joe Hooker that he doesn't seize upon, opportunities for the Confederates, but also problems for both sides. Stuart? Okay, I often tell people about this battlefield that all of the 11th Corps does not run. And one of the untried regiments that Chris had mentioned earlier, the 26th Wisconsin, was here. And I had a tour with a descendant from the 26th Wisconsin. I took him over to the uh, Wilderness Baptist Church. He walked all over that ground, and then I took him to see the Hawkins Farm. Well, in the day of the battle, the 26th Wisconsin would leave the church and go to the Hawkins Farm. They were one of the furthest regiments to the north for Schertz's men. Now, the 58th New York and the 82nd Illinois were sent over to help the 26th, but then they were called away, so the 26th was left by itself. They had to split up and send some soldiers just a little bit further as like a skirmish line. But what happens, they're going to be overwhelmed by the Confederates. They're going to suffer tremendous casualties. They're going to retreat, but instead of retreating all the way with the 11th Corps, they're going to stop, and then they will fight with the 3rd Corps. And one of the things that I just find remarkable is I, I share these stories and listen to these stories. We get to be out on this battlefield on the anniversary of the battle, and it's just a spectacular opportunity. We can be out here because of the generosity of our members and the partners that we work with to preserve these battlefields. So I want to bring on Tom Van Winkle, president of the Central Virginia Battlefield Trust, to talk a little bit about some of the preservation work that CVBT does to help make these battlefields available to you, Tom. Thank you, Chris. We're going to take a little break here from the battle action and go to a little preservation action. Um, it's no secret that this portion of Central Virginia is uh, a development nightmare. As was spoke about early on today, we are dead center between Washington, D.C. and Richmond, Virginia, which makes us a, pretty much a bedroom community. So we had four battles here, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Wilderness, and Spotsylvania Courthouse in 18 months with over 100,000 casualties most of it on overlapping grounds. And those are the grounds that we and you are helping preserve these days. The property we're on right now was a partnership between CBBT and ABT, saving these 40 plus acres, and that's the reason why we're able to be here today. We're also talking about one of the biggest iconic movements here, Jackson's flank attack. Since 1998, CBBT and ABT, both in concert or, and separately, have been putting this entire flank attack back together. So it's been a 25 year project to date of taking pieces of this battlefield and this flank attack with the hopes that one day we can walk large portions of it contiguously without having any interruption. So thank you for all you do for both organizations. Keep supporting us and we will save more battlefield. And so the attack has swept through here. The Federals are falling back. Joe Hooker is reacting and Stonewall Jackson's changing the game plan. Night is beginning to fall, and the fog of war hangs heavy over Chancellorsville. What happens next? 
Well, you'll have to tune into our next video to find out. We're going to head down the road a little bit to the Chancellorsville Battlefield Visitor Center and talk about how this all culminates. In the meantime, I want to thank Chris White, Stuart Henderson, Dan Davis behind the camera, Sarah K. Barley, and Tom Van Winkle. I'm Chris Mikowski. Thank you for everything you've done. Like these videos, share them, spread the word about the good work that the American Battlefield Trust is doing with your support. Thank you for everything you do to support battlefield preservation and education.